Tori Higginson is with me now in Studio Q. So Natalie's story continues. Um, How's she doing as the season begins? Oh, Natalie, she's so strong. Um, She's good. She's full of um, hope and positivity and faith. Nice. Yeah. Do you relate to her in that that way? I kind of do, actually. I think... um, I mean, I think our our attitude is all we have at the end of the day. No matter what's put in front of you, good or bad, it's how you perceive it is what's going to be your experience of that. And I think she's struggling really hard to – the only thing that you have control over is that. I think the first season is her dealing with the um, reality that she has this disease and how is she going to – control it. How is she going to control how her kids are going to deal with life? How Mm. is she going to control how she's going to deal with her end? And I think the second season is more her accepting a lack of control and realizing all she can control is her attitude. So Mm. it's very positive and very strong, and I admire her for it. After having months off from taping, what is it like to step back into such an emotionally heavy role? Well, it's interesting. I was just saying, actually, this morning, because um, we just wrapped on Saturday. was our last day, and we had our wrap party on Monday, and I drove here yesterday. So this morning was sort of the first morning I woke up going, I don't have to think about dying today. Oh, right. <laughs> what a nice thought. <laughs> so it's interesting. I, I sort of say at the beginning of every season, I feel very grateful for – being put in a situation that I have to meditate daily on my mortality because mm. I think the more we do that, the more grateful we are for the yeah. life we have, the more things sit in perspective very quickly. But by the end of the season, your skin gets really thin and you get sort of tired of being so grateful. Yeah, <laughs> It's bet. sort of exhausting being positive and you want to, um, yeah, not have to be profound. Not have to think about life in that way. Be able to gripe about a few things here and there. Exactly. Get snippy. (laughs) You know, cancer is is such a reality. I I don't think there's a family uh, on the planet that can say there's been nobody with cancer. So it's such a reality for so many people. But television is also entertainment. How has the show gone about balancing the two? I think they've done a beautiful job. Joseph Kay, our uh, main writer and showrunner, and he's surrounded himself with some wonderful younger writers, Celeste Parr, Rachel Langer, Max Moran. Really, um, they're funny. They are honest. They, they, find, um, they find humor in all of it. I mean, all of the characters in the show are deeply dysfunctional and deeply delightful, and they all have their own crises that are going on. And, and I think that's the other beautiful reality of this show is the very first episode, you're told this huge earth-shattering thing, this character is going to die in a year. Mm. And then life goes on. Every other character has issues, has dramas, has, and that's what happens. One person's story doesn't change everybody else's story. Right. And I think throwing all these people in the middle of that, there's some very funny stuff. There's funny stuff with how they are dealing with these issues, and there's funny stuff with how they are denying these issues. Oh, Yes. So I, I think they found a beautiful balance between laughing and heart. Uh, and that's always so, that's the way you got to get through those hard times anyway, right? Is through the laughter. And you've had such an incredible career. Your face is familiar to Canadians everywhere. But you were saying that around this role, people are actually approaching you and sharing some of their own personal stories. What's that like? And can you can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's quite astounding. I mean, my first experience with that was through, I've done a fair amount of sci-fi, and the science fiction fans are very rabid and very loyal. <laughs> They're intense. Oh they are gosh. not casual people. They are not at all. And at first, I disliked that whole process. I wasn't comfortable with it. Um, now I love it because I also come from theater, so there's something wonderful about knowing your audience and having a dialogue with your audience. So I I really learned to love that dialogue. But with this show, I mean, it's happened to me on a few occasions where somebody just comes and sits down beside me and starts talking to me about their mother in hospital and what she's going through. And this woman started crying. That's one of them I'm thinking of on the streetcar. And But two to five minutes into this conversation, I'm just in there listening going, I, I don't know you, but I didn't, yeah. Yeah, I didn't know what to do with it. And she had sort of didn't realize she didn't know me. 
this look of realization came over her face and she went, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I just felt I was talking to my friend who's been a part of my process of my mother dying of cancer. Right. It was really, it's really beautiful and it's very, you feel very humbled by it and you feel very, um, there's just a warmth of being invited into people's personal pain. <laughs> After you've had that experience, I'm sure that woman then along with all the others must be in your mind does it affect your performance knowing that they are watching? I think it helps me get to a place. I mean, it's. I do feel there is a responsibility of, of being very honest, which is why I, I feel very exhausted at the end of each season. My skin gets very thin because right. even if I'm doing a scene where it is a light scene and it's a funny scene and there's no mention of cancer – I still have to, before I walk into that scene, have a moment that I really resonate with this reality, that this is happening inside of me. Mm. Even if I'm not going to talk about it, it has to be present in that scene. And that's to honor the reality of that situation and all those people that are watching it that are going through that or watching somebody they love is going through that. And, and your character, Natalie, is trying to make the most of the time she has left in the face of this. What kind of things is she doing to do that? Uh, this season, she's having some fun. She's trying to – she is really trying to be present. And I think um, – you know, that's the irony. I think all these religions that are, exist are there to try to make us live in a present. But really, we only live in a present when we're told that time is finite. Yeah. And we only truly understand that when you're given a due date or an end date. <laughs> it's too bad, eh? It's so yeah. bad. It's so crazy. And yet, yet it's also... It's also what we do to function, to survive, because if we do live every second purely, as I was saying earlier, that present, it's exhausting. Yeah, true. Yeah. So it's that weird sort of spiral. So this year she's trying to have more fun with it. She's trying not to be so heavy with it, trying not to be so philosophical. She's, you know, she gets to zip line and I had to have a scuba diving oh, lesson oh, oh, for oh. another reason. But um, yeah. Did so you actually do the zip line? I did. Are you, do you have any fear of heights or anything like that? I was a little bit nervous walking up. And then the first time we took off, I went, let's do it again. I loved oh, it. Oh, wow. Really? You're so brave. That would I'd be like, you have to bring in a double. <laughs> um, you know, her kind of attitude is, uh, do you think that is the typical attitude to someone facing a cancer diagnosis? I don't think there is a typical attitude. I mean, I think there's probably a lot of phases that everybody goes through. Um, some people might get stuck at one phase. Some people might never make another. Mm. I think I think there is, um, you know, there's acceptance. There's anger. There's fear. Yeah. There's um, hopefully you get to a place of peace and gratitude mm. with that. I think she's a very she's a very smart woman. She's a very compassionate woman. Her biggest fuel is her children. She's got these kids, and she wants to, A, make sure they're going to be okay. She also doesn't want their last experience of her to be one of pain and sadness. Yeah. She There's a line in the first episode of the first season where she talks about she doesn't want to tell everybody what she has because she doesn't want that to be how she's known. I think there a, is a thing in our culture that we look at death and we look at illness as a failure. Yeah, it's true. They lost their battle with cancer. Yeah. Like somehow they had control over whether they would win that. Right? Yeah. And there's this whole sort of new age thing, which, and I actually, I'm a, I'm a big believer in alternative medicines, and I'm a big believer mm. in attitude and meditation. But there was this other sort of phase of what happened where people went, oh, if you got cancer, it's because you did something. You were angry or you were. Yes. And that's really dangerous. And that's really unfair. Yeah, it really is. And and people treat it almost like um, like you're going to catch it. Like you have to distance yourself from the person who's going through these things. We, I, I guess we just we try to escape grief a lot. Yeah. And grief is kind of a natural part of life. Yeah, absolutely. It's, a, it's the balance. It's a great uh, sentence, escape grief. But yeah, it's, it's a part of the balance, right? Yeah. I actually were just talking about the film Wings of Desire the other day and about how um, beautiful – that film is this these angels that are witnessing the pain of humanity and yet they still want to trade it up and to be human. Yeah. And if we didn't have grief and if we didn't have death, well, life, no joy. Absolutely. You got to feel one to feel the other. Yeah. Now, dealing with terminal diagnosis is something that so many people in Canada can relate to. And there's been more public talk about it lately. Gord Downey mm -hmm. um, letting the country know. 
with you being in this experience of playing Natalie, how did you react when you heard the news about Gord? Uh, it's, um, yeah, I mean, my heart sort of grew and broke in the same mm. moment, you know. It, it is the most... It's the one thing that connects all of us, disease and death yeah. and, and that fear. And my heart goes out to him. I think it's so beautiful how they did that tour. And yeah. to share that passion and to share his emotion and to share his reality in that way was really astounding. And I think he did a lot for people who have similar diagnoses. And, and to take the shame away because yes. there is a shame. There's the, the, We shame people on for... It's such a strange so, occurrence. And it's because we're frightened of it because we yeah. don't want to deal with it. So it's exactly what you said. We're frightened that it's contagious. Yeah. So if we go, well, that's you and not me. And what he did was say, no, this is me and I am still me. Yeah. Just things are going a certain way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How did you research to get ready to play this? Well, um, interestingly, I mean, I was actually so busy coming running up to it. I didn't have a lot of time to dive in as television is so crazy. You get the job and then a week later you're moving somewhere and yeah. settling in. Um, I'd had a health issue myself four years ago, which I find very um, mm -hmm. wonderful how life works. And I had this situation that – I was in a hospital in ICU, actually, for about a month. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Every night, somebody in the unit would, would die. Ooh. And so I was surrounded by this reality. And, and I learned so much because of that. And I, I left that experience feeling grateful for the experience because it did make me meditate on my mortality. And since then... I've had a very active dialogue about why don't we speak about death in our culture and why are we frightened of it? I was then in Australia in November of uh, two years ago, and I met this woman, Zenith, and she calls herself a death walker. What she does is mm. walk people up to the point of dying. She helps them ask the right questions about what do I believe in. And I just it was just random. I ended up staying with this woman in Australia um, when I was over there doing conventions, actually. So these two huge occurrences happened, and two months later, uh, after meeting Zenith, I got cast in this show. I found that very beautiful, and I've been pulling on both of those experiences daily. And Maybe random, maybe not random. Exactly right. Maybe just as it was meant to, yeah. to roll out. Who knows? Um, the, uh, the, the experience of playing this role and this experience that you went through in the hospital, does it have you thinking differently about your own life and death, your own mortality? Constantly. Constantly. It actually has, I mean, I, I live in a much more um, grateful place. I really do. I mean, it doesn't mean mm. I don't get pissed off at times. It doesn't mean yeah. I don't get, you know, I still find myself with road rage. But I'm quicker <laughs> now to laugh at myself, to catch myself and go, oh, yeah, that's ridiculous. Um, yeah, it really has affected me. And um, I am in eternally grateful for it. And you're saying that you, you're talking more openly about it and hoping that other people will. What do you think is the benefit of that, of people talking more openly about their mortality? I think, I mean, it's, it sounds um, a cliche, but I think it is that idea of fear of death is fear of living. And, and if we take, if we absolutely embrace the fact that we are going to die, it is going to change the way we experience this day right now. Mm. And I think it means we live with more kindness. We live with more forgiveness. We probably live with a little bit more um, courage as well. The world could sure use all of those things. All three of those, yeah, right? In a, in a little bit more abundance. Um, this life was actually adapted from a Radio Canada uh, hit drama called Nouvelle Adresse. And you said last year that you did not want to see that before you actually played uh, because uh, Masha Granon's portrayal of Natalie might affect yours. Have you seen it now? I still haven't. I, I love Masha Grano's acting so much. She's so wonderful. Um, and I, you know, most of us as actors are deeply insecure creatures. And so it would be very difficult to not be affected and to not compare and to not, and also to maybe somehow um, mimic something to go, oh, that's right. so beautiful. And now I'm going to uh, sort of own that and, and not listen to my own instincts. So I'm going to wait until... Natalie's journey is finished. My Natalie's journey is finished. Oh, and then I'm going to okay. really enjoy sitting down and watching that. Oh, that'll be fun. And how will Natalie's journey finish? You know, we're on season two now. Will there be an end, the kind of end that we would be expecting? 
I think they have to. I mean, I think they have to be honest and to be true to how they set up the series and to that first episode. Um, however much as an actor, you know, I love this show. I love every one of our actors are fabulous. The ensemble mm. is such a, a gift to, to work with. Our crew is amazing. Our writers, our producers, like it's a really unique experience. So because of that, it's sort of heartbreaking. This is the kind of show you want to go on for 10 years. Yeah. I won't go on with it for 10 years. Maybe the show will go on for 10 years, which would be wonderful, um, but I won't. And so that's very bittersweet, but yeah. I think that's the way to honor it, and that's what the show is about. It's That's the reality of it is that people die. How will it feel? I mean, for the listener, they don't know what it's like to act and to get into a character. How will it feel for you the day that Natalie dies? It'll be awful. I'm going to start crying now. It'll be awful. Yeah. I'll be very, very sad, and it will be... Um, yeah, it'll be very sad. I'll mourn her. I will mourn her. Wow. Has playing her changed you? I think so. I hope so. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel she, she, I admire her strength so much. I admire her. And she's also, she's, you know, she's broken too. She plays the victim a bit. She's yeah. a little bit, um, uh, what's the word? holier than thou at times. Yeah. She can fall into that a little bit. Um, but she has a remarkable strength and a, a remarkable compassion. And so that has has reminds me in my daily movements. But mm. more so is just her experience is reminding me of this is fast. Life is fast. It sure is. And we have no control over anything except for how we choose to greet the minute. So. When she, um, when you started to play her, did you think it would have this kind of an impact? I kind of did, yeah. yeah. I mean, I read those first scripts, and I went, this is a beautiful and important story to tell, and I think it has to have that impact. Yeah. Well, it's certainly having an impact on the rest of the country. Thank you so much and your busy schedule for coming by. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. This is a delight.